On a cold January night in 1950, a military transport plane rumbles through the Alaskan skies. On board, 44 people en route to Montana. Two hours into the flight, they communicate with base. And then, they vanish. No one knows what happened or what they saw, only that they have never been seen again. Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. Something out there. Three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go missing in Alaska. All right, guys, here we go. All right, ready to roll. The team's investigation begins outside Snag, Canada, right at the edge of the triangle, heading toward the site of the last reported communication of the missing C-54. <laughs> she gave me. Weather's looking pretty good. No single event captures the mystery of the Alaska Triangle better than this lost C-54. When one person goes missing, that's strange. But when a whole plane load of people vanishes, now that's a real mystery. It's been 65 years since this plane went missing. I think it's incredible that really no sign of it, no trace of it at all. 70 to 100 planes that actually searched for this thing. Actually had a couple of planes that went down during the search. Do you think the melt would push something off? Something would be found at some point. The Douglas C-54 was a large plane for its time. The four-prop transport had a wingspan of 117 feet and a max takeoff weight of over 35 tons. Capable of transporting 50 troops, it was at near capacity for its fateful trip. Somehow, it did not leave a shred of evidence behind. The fact that it just disappeared is mind-boggling, really. As an investigator, my initial guess is that the plane just crashed. That's the easy answer, but it does leave a lot of questions. Why no distress call? And why were no pieces of the plane ever found? The Alaska Triangle is a huge area, but this is a massive plane. It really feels like someone should have found something by now. Have, have you ever seen any airplane wreckage out here? I have, actually. Lots of, uh, almost every pass has quite a few wreckages. Small and big planes alike. Why does this area have so many crashes? With the bad weather, it can uh, really push you into a sticky situation where uh, you end up having to drive it into the ground, unfortunately. The number of air disasters in Alaska is staggering. Over the past decade, nearly 1,200 craft have gone down, almost four times the average per state, despite having only 0.2% of the U.S. population. One reason there's so many crashes here in Alaska is there's so many inexperienced pilots here. There are places within the state you can only get to by plane, and there's too many people doing it. Another reason is the dangerous wind shear that can come off the mountains. Even an experienced pilot could have problems with this. In native lore, mountains are often looked at as gods that can judge you. They can either protect you or strike you down. So we're coming right up on the location where the missing C-54 had its last radio transmission and essentially disappeared from radar, right up here in this little valley. Look how close we are to the mountain. Another reading there again. We're holding pretty steady at 2.5 to 5. Ken Gerhard has an EMF meter, a device commonly used to measure electric flow and power lines. 
but it can also detect electromagnetic radiation in the atmosphere. A small amount of background radiation is normal, but any change in level suggests a hidden anomaly. Have you ever had any experiences with any magnetic disturbances out here? Yeah, a little bit on the compass. Every once in a while, it can uh, spin on you. Why would you think that that would occur? I was hoping maybe you guys could tell me. Tell where we are about now, Jack? For the last radio transmission came. The weather. Oh, the white wall right there, huh? Yeah, I can't. Look at the visibility here. You can't see anything beyond uh, a quarter of a mile. Can we get some readings here on this can? Hey, hold on here, guys. Weather's changing on us real quick in this valley. Look at that. Oh, the first time it's reacted like that. It's kind of like a solid... Run back through that last valley. Yeah. Oh, holy crap, look at that. Did you no. see that? Just spiked red. Right off the charts. Hold that. Everybody hold on. Hold that? Yeah. Crazy. Hey. Wow, yeah, we're definitely hitting some turbulence now. Whole thing's shaking. My ears are popping. Whoa! See that? Getting a pretty active reading right now. Sorry guys, this weather creeped out of nowhere. I gotta take us back. <laughs> Whoa! Man, that chopper ride was utterly terrifying. I mean, you had the sudden surge of turbulence, there were the electromagnetic spikes. I honestly don't even really know what all that meant, or even if those two things are related. According to meteorological models, violent weather is caused by pressure differentials, not electromagnetism. Were the EMF spikes before the storm just a coincidence? Or is there more to it? It seems like a lead. Got my adrenaline I'm pumping there for a second, man. Got mine going. Now my heart's going. I'm sweating. You know, back in the 1970s, there was a study conducted to look at different areas around the planet where there were high incidences of missing airplanes and ships. And a lot of it was related back to geomagnetic properties. But there's this theory that perhaps we're dealing with these sort of vortex areas. A vortex is an area of intense concentrated spinning. Natural examples are whirlpools in water or the air of a tornado. It's been speculated by Einstein, among others, that they can also form in the fabric of space-time and connect different areas of the universe. A vortex is suspected in the infamous Bermuda Triangle, which has claimed planes and boats for centuries. In fact, Abnormal readings have been recorded in 12 triangular regions around the world, known as the vile vortices. Could the Alaska Triangle be number 13? Could a vortex account for the missing C-54 and strange readings in this area? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm eager to figure out exactly what's going on to uh, explore the vortex theory. If there's any possibility like something like that could exist over Alaska. The vile vortices all feature strange disappearances. But what's interesting is that they all match up geometrically along the same lines of latitude. On the surface, Alaska doesn't really fit the pattern. But maybe the Alaska Triangle represents one of these areas that's yet to be discovered that features a similar connection. The team feels fortunate to escape the initial phase of their investigation in one piece. But pilots have been reporting anomalies and possible vortices in Alaskan aviation for decades. Jeffrey and his dad, Earl, were on a routine flight when they experienced something incredible. It was a beautiful day. You could see for miles. It was just gorgeous. And then we saw these clouds, and they were swirling in this very strange motion. We really hadn't seen anything like it. And then there was this wind that just shot up. It was sucking us towards it. Somehow, he was able to balance out the plane. We both got out of our lives. Just pure luck that day that both of us got out. Ken's idea of the vortex theory is very interesting, but this is Alaska. There's a lot of dangerous mountains and very crazy weather. So Tommy and I are headed to Anchorage to meet with a geophysicist named Gary Hufford. How you doing, Gary? Pretty good, and you? Good, thanks. We want to find out all the different reasons why this plane might have gone down. This is within this area where the C-54 went down right on the Alaska-Yukon border. And after two and a half hours of communication off and on with Elmendorf, uh, 
they basically disappeared. And they reported their last time that, that they thought they were over the little town of Snag. Where the problem is, is that if they were not on that route, and they were actually deviating a bit, just to the south are some of the nastiest coastal mountains one can find in the world. End up in what we call the coffin corner. You've got strong winds, and with strong winds comes turbulence. You have winds coming down gaps. You have aircraft icing, and it means that if you take a flight like that, you may in fact run into some really nasty weather. If it's up in these mountains, the amount of snow they get a year is phenomenal. You could have had that plane crash in those mountains on a day when it snowed four or five feet, which would have hidden the plane very, very rapidly. Very, very quickly. Is there a connection between the weather in Alaska and the magnetic fields that uh, we have here? It's certainly one of those things you have to look at. It is certainly something that you notice that pilots up here are really aware of magnetic deviation because up here there's a number of things that don't work. What would that have done to their natural instruments that they're using in the, in the cockpit at that time? The biggest problem when you see the magnetic storms is the compass. You'll see it bounce around. If you're trying to go north to a target, you're going to end up northeast. And man, all of a sudden you find out you're 40 miles, 60 miles too far to the east. Hearing Gary talk about planes that go off course and winding up in places called the coffin corner makes me think that this is just a crash. I don't think he'll support the vortex theory, but there's some evidence for it, so I have to ask the question. I was wondering if you could give us your opinion on possibilities of vortexes. Well, that one's a tough one to call. Um, it's certainly one of those things you have to look at. There are some clues that say we have magnetic field changes. When I look at the magnetic vortex possibility, this is an area that we should be looking at. You hear the numbers about accidents, and Alaska is always many times above the, the norm for the United States, and yet we only have 0.2% of the nation's population. The question is, what's going on? Alaska, a vast expanse of untouched lands where more than 3,000 people per year go missing. Are the disappearances related to the strange legends of the Alaska Triangle? Witnesses claim visions of hairy beasts, carnivorous gnomes, even a mysterious vortex in the sky. In 1950, a military C-54 vanished with 44 personnel on board. The team has learned that magnetic anomalies might have something to do with the disappearance. Is it possible Magnetic deviations created by a vortex might drive a plane fatally off course, or even make it disappear completely. While Ken Gerhardt researches that possibility, former cop Jax Atwell and folklorist Tommy Joseph have a meeting with aviation historian Rob Stapleton. Hey, hello, how are you? Good. They want to learn more about the military's initial search efforts in January of 1950. Here you go. There's some bedtime reading for you. It talks about uh, C-54. There's also information in here about Operation Mike. Operation Mike was the code name for the search and rescue effort to find the C-54, named for the missing plane's commander, First Lieutenant Kyle McMichael. Operation Mike utilized 7,000 military personnel and covered more than 55,000 square miles. It lasted for nearly three weeks, but found no sign of the aircraft. You know, when they were determining the search pattern, if they considered alternative things like the magnetic fields and other issues like that that might have led it further off course? Um, that's kind of interesting. I would say that, you know, the airplane probably encountered a heavy mining area, and there have been a lot of reports of real strange magnetic activity. Over here on the 40-mile country, there were some people that said that they had heard an airplane flying low, and there was a ranger that even thought that it, he heard a thud after it flew over. Rob's theory is interesting. He thinks that magnetism might have played a role in the crash, but not as part of a vortex. He's saying that a high concentration of metal within the mining area of the 40-mile country could have thrown the plane's instruments off. This is definitely an area we should check out. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Pleasure's all mine. Based on the reports of magnetic disturbances and witness testimonies, the team heads out to 40 Mile Country, 
named for the nearby 40 Mile River, to search for any signs of the missing C-54 plane. I'm gonna keep a lookout, see if I can see anything. Probably a log shot, but who knows? Maybe mining areas are a bigger problem for planes than we thought. The mining industry has long been a cornerstone of the Alaskan economy. Zinc, lead, gold, and iron have been pulled from the rugged mountains in 40-mile country by the ton. Iron especially is a ferromagnetic metal that could affect the compasses of a passing aircraft. It's obviously one of the most treacherous places that you could possibly be flying over. I mean, it's probably treacherous air currents that kind of float off of these mountains and so forth. Okay, we are definitely now in the area you requested. Hey, look up here! What's this? Looks like something's buried in the snow. What is that? See that? Hey, Paul, can you let us down there? I'll get you as close as I can, but I'm gonna have to drop you off and move down to a safer elevation for a while. We jump off that helicopter, we immediately plunge in a couple feet of snow. I know Ken is chasing the vortex theory, but when I look at this large valley, I can see how a plane could disappear out here. So the chopper dropped us off about 200 yards from the object we sighted. I'm really glad we have proper gear because this is a barren and unforgiving landscape. Anything could happen out here. Here we are, guys. Not gonna be able to walk in this stuff, that's for sure. I think we're at the spot. Yeah, this is a perfect starting point. Uh, let's see. Good thing we have these shoes, man. Could that be a piece of our plane? Maybe. Holy crap. Citation. Looks like the hood of a snow machine. What would a snow machine be doing out here, man? That doesn't make any sense. We're in the middle of nowhere. You know, hunters, trappers, they'd come up this far? I'm sure they could get up here, yeah. Well, we're in a right area to search. We devised a plan to scan the area, but we're also going to utilize all the instruments that we brought along, in particular the metal detector and the EMF reader to see if we can find anything that's buried under the snow. This is really tough terrain. We're spreading out so we can cover as much ground as possible. But this is a huge area. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Hey, Ken, over here. Come check out these readings. Jumping. Yeah? Color in there. Yeah. There we go, there we oh, go. Oh, you yeah. see that? Yeah, there we go. Jumping off the charts. For the second time in this investigation, the EMF meter picks up strange jumps in electromagnetic radiation levels. If the meter was picking up the metal in this area, the reading should stay consistently high but the wild, inconsistent fluctuations suggest some mysterious variable beyond just rocks. Similar erratic readings have been recorded in the Bermuda Triangle. Could these spikes reveal the opening and shutting of a vortex? There is a scientific precedence for this process. Black holes. A black hole begins with a collapsing star that explodes in a supernova, which releases massive amounts of radiation. The inner core then collapses, creating a vacuum so strong not even light can escape. Could the same process happen on a much smaller scale, right here on Earth? It is possible that vortices have been seen by native peoples for thousands of years. Mystical spirals can be found in the native artwork all over the Americas, all the way to Europe. Whatever inspired that art obviously made a lasting impression. You know, with regard to the vortex, I do have a theory that when the vortex opens, theoretically, it releases this huge amount of electromagnetic energy. But when it closes, and it would have to close quickly, it couldn't be open for a long time, or it would suck in everything, right? When it closes, you have kind of a dramatic reduction in electromagnetic energy. That type of energy might affect, you know, uh, aircraft, instruments, things like that, and cause them to crash. The vortex theory sounds cool, but until I see some hard evidence, like someone's actually recorded this thing, it's all just a bunch of talk to me.
I think the plane can still be found. With the sun heading down, the team has to abandon their search for now. But in order to explore his vortex theory, Ken heads to meet with Melanie Hodgman, a fellow investigator of the unexplained. Ken Gerhard. Hi, Ken. Really nice to meet Pleasure you. Pleasure to meet you. Thanks so much for meeting me out here. Not a problem. Ken wonders if a vortex could act as a doorway through which planes in the Alaska Triangle could disappear. And if so, could the door go both ways? Wow, this is really breathtaking, Melanie. It is a beautiful view, but the whole state of Alaska, that's what I love about it here. The whole state looks like a postcard. I wanted to bring you to the site because I had the UFO sighting right over in this area. It was the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life. And we're right in the trajectory that that C-54 flight was taking in the 1950s. This revelation from Melanie about seeing a UFO here, this could be a game changer for our investigation. OK, so we're actually in the general vicinity right now. We're in the 1950s. A Douglas C-54 just disappeared. I wanted to bring you to the site because I had the UFO sighting right over in this area. It was the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life. I saw a light that was perfectly round, and it was really bright. And then it kind of split into two, turned red, and then the first one joined the second one, and it turned white again. And then it just was gone. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. It is amazing. I, I just, yeah. it's the first one that I've ever seen through a camera. Our universe is so immense. And I think these entities may be on a parallel line at the same time that we're here. And they, and they just have the secret. They know how to go from, from parallel to parallel. As strange as parallel universes sound, scientists at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland are testing this exact phenomenon. Using nearly 12 trillion teravolts, they hope to create a mini black hole that could be a portal to another dimension. If humans are this close to such a breakthrough, what about aliens that are far more advanced? There are a lot of UFO sightings in Alaska. As a matter of fact, um, you can count hundreds and hundreds. Really? Yes. Melanie's sighting, along with the high number of UFOs in Alaska, now has me convinced that there's got to be more to this vortex. While Ken considers Melanie's UFO theory, Jax and Tommy pay another visit to aviation expert Rob Stapleton. Rob left us a message that he has some new information that might be relevant to our case. We're going to stop by and see what it is. You want to see what we found? Yeah. OK. Well, they don't look like airplane parts, though. So. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was the disappointing part. <laughs> so what was that message all about? Well, you know, uh, after you were here last time, I went back and did some more research at the University of Alaska. And I found between January 22nd and January 26th, 1950, there was UFO sightings during that time frame. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, UFO sightings. This is, this is interesting to me. Uh, um, what do you yeah, think there? Well, I found it kind of interesting because they uh, quoted a Air Force lieutenant colonel as actually spotting them from the military. So. You know, that's fairly credible. According to official reports, Lieutenant Colonel Lester F. Matheson was on Elmendorf Air Force Base, where the C-54's flight originated, when something caught his eye. He saw three orange-red objects moving together high in the air. They were shaped like cigars and flying in a curved line towards the north. The military ruled out any known aircraft. And the sightings happened just two days after the C-54's disappearance. Is there a connection to the sighting Melanie had decades later? The UFOs she reported were not cigar-shaped. Or were they? A closer look reveals the two lights could have been a singular cigar-shaped craft. I think we need to talk with Ken about this and see what he thinks. This idea that UFOs may be involved adds a whole new level to our investigation. If there is a vortex, the idea of aliens being involved with it, that's huge. Alaska has long been known as a hotbed of UFO activity. It's consistently among the top states in the US for sightings per capita. Why? With nine military bases in the state, it's possible many are simply misidentified government aircraft. 
But is there something else going on? Could extraterrestrials be invading this vast area and making planes go missing, including the C-54? The team wants to dig deeper into the data. Hey, Ken. How's it going? What have you been up to? Well, um, I've been kind of like logging some of these UFO sightings in Alaska. There's a whole bunch of them. Show us what you got here. According to the classified government files, the US intelligence actually took like an active interest in UFO sightings over Alaska from 1947 to 1950. So I mean, it was on their radar. So we got a couple of yeah, this... unusual occurrences. Let's start putting these on the map. The team plots sightings across Southeast Alaska, the area where the C-54 vanished. Is this all we have? Um, no, there's a bunch more. I mean, I'm just starting on this project well, why right now. Why don't we now. put a couple more up and then maybe connect some dots? All right. We should check everything over the last 60 years. As they fill in the map, a telling pattern begins to emerge. We start to notice a cluster developing in one particular area, and it's a really remote area, which makes the high number of sightings really compelling. The UFO cluster is a bit off of the suspected flight path of the C-54. But when you consider the magnetic deviations that could have affected the instruments, it's possible the plane could have ended up there. Could this cluster of sightings be the focal point of the vortex, a portal where aliens travel into and out of our world and take those of us they wish? I think that's our spot right there. I think we need to gear up, man, as soon as possible. We need to get on it. In the skies of Alaska, planes go missing with alarming regularity. Is the Alaska Triangle home to a hidden vortex that caused the disappearance of a military C-54 in 1950? Ham radio enthusiast Walter Benally believes he's seen proof it exists. I live in a very remote area, and we use ham radio as a reliable means of communication. One day, I hear a call as a pilot in distress giving coordinates. I see that his flight plan's going right over my house. So I look out and I could see his plane. I hear a squelch on the radio. When I look back up, the plane's gone. It just disappeared. I can't explain it. We're flying to our UFO hotspot, and I'm really excited because we're finding a correlation between a high number of UFO sightings and the spot where this airplane disappeared. You guys all ready? All right. I'll see it. This desolate area only sees a handful of mountaineers each year, making the high rate of UFO sightings here even more remarkable. The interesting thing about this area, there are no regular flight paths here. So if people are seeing flying objects here, that's really strange. You realize just how the deep this snow gets sometimes. There could be literally anything buried under here. All right. Good spot? Yeah. We're at the area that we mapped out. It really holds a lot of promise based on all of the UFO reports. And I'm actually anxious to see what kind of readings we might get that might point to the existence of a vortex. What you got there, bud? Nada. Nothing at all? What do you think of that? This is the area where most of those UFOs were seen in the time period. I think this might be a good spot to play with our new toy. We've been using a lot of high-tech instruments in our investigation, but now we're going to take things up a notch because we've got a drone. So far, all the tests that we've done have been at ground level. But with the drone, we can test the atmosphere at higher altitudes. What's really cool is that it also takes readings of electromagnetic energy, and it'll send those back to our phone in real time. We are a go. What you got there, bud? Uh, looks normal so far. You gotta get it up there high. Whoa, this is weird. This is weird. What you got? It's spiking. It's spiking. Check it out. I'm looking at my app, and suddenly everything goes haywire. I mean, all the readings are off the charts. I've never experienced anything like this before in all my years of research. Man, this is like 
really strange. I got no eyes, guys. Where's our toy? I lost it. I can't I'm, see it. Man, I'm losing everything here. Tommy, you got anything? No, I just lost it. It was here a minute ago. It was just gone. I looked down it's at gone. the phone here, and it was completely gone. I don't hear anything either. I honestly have no idea what happened to the drone. It's the strangest thing I've ever experienced. I mean, one second it's there, the next second it's completely gone. Error, error. It's not possible, we lost it that fast. Error. So those readings just went off the charts and it's just gone. Uh, I don't know, man. Hey guys, look like a storm's coming in. These clouds are dropping. Oh, it's gonna crap. be snowing here soon. Call in Sam, we gotta get out of here. Losing our drone is a big setback. All the information is gone. Now we need to regroup and see where we go from here. With violent storm clouds closing in, the team knows they have to leave. They've experienced sudden Alaska weather changes once. They don't want to again. What do you guys think happened to the drone? Well, it just took off. I think uh, we are right out of range. It's really distressing. Because, I mean, obviously, we have a lot invested in that piece of equipment. You know, we don't have the drone anymore, so we're just going to have to kind of rethink things. It looks like the weather is getting uh, a little hairy here, so hang tight. Wow, this is crazy. Holy cow. I'm changing flight altitude and searching for a smoother pocket. Try to stay relaxed. Wow. Weather is ridiculous. We can't see anything here. This can't be good. This is pretty hairy. Heading right into a whiteout here. Okay, it looks like the change in the pitch has given us some positive stability. Thanks for hanging in there. The crazy part about being in a helicopter in this type of weather is you can feel everything. You can feel every wind gust, and it feels like you're going to slam in the mountain at any moment. Hey guys, look. Look at that. What do you got? What do you got? What is it, Jack? So this is the moment we've all been waiting for. Probably aren't gonna have much time down here, guys, so we have to work fast. This airplane wreckage might be the C-54. We could potentially be solving a mystery that's lasted for 60 years. All right, guys, stay tight. We're hiking across the glacier towards this plane wreckage, and it's extremely frustrating. It's taking us forever. The snow is very deep, it's very slippery, it's freezing cold out here, and we're totally exhausted at this point, but we just want to get there. This air's really thin up here. And because we know that the weather conditions can change in an instant, we've got to hurry up and get this thing done. We're almost there, guys. <sighs> that thing's pretty mangled. Any markings on it? Well, I mean, I see the uh, good old insignia of the USA. What do you think, guys? C-54? Maybe. It's definitely a military aircraft. It's amazing how well preserved it is. Look at the hoses still on there. As we get to the crash site, I've kind of got mixed feelings. I'm encouraged by the fact that this is obviously a US Air Force plane, so this could be the missing C-54. But on the other hand, I'm reminded about the tragedy that occurred here. People actually lost their lives in this accident. Knowing this is a military crash, the team avoids going inside the plane out of respect they start gathering information so they can report it to authorities. Hey guys, I've got some numbers here on this uh, fuselage. I'm gonna, maybe a serial number or something, I'm gonna get a shot. Copy that. This is the engine compartment here. Side panel, totally gone. Got cables and pulleys. <sighs> yeah, I'm seeing some marking here on this, I believe a wing piece here. Let's get a snuff. If this is the C-54, maybe with all the smelting snow and the receding glaciers, it's uncovered the plane after all these years. The first thing I do when I get to the crash site is take some readings. I want to use my K2 meter to see if I pick up any electromagnetic anomalies in this location. I'm going to take some readings now. I'm curious to see. 
Activity. And the readings are off the charts. I'd say we're definitely in vortex territory. We gotta get a shot of that. Look, there's some serial numbers on the side. It's like a part number or something. It was definitely a military plane, but I mean. Take a, take a shot of that right there. That's a pretty good sticker right above your head. Which one? This one? Yeah. Got it. Guys, we got five minutes till the helicopter's here. Let's roll through our checklist. Ken, you got all your readings? I got plenty of readings, man. Electromagnetic and radiation. All right, what we got here? We've got two motors and the wing and a fuselage. We got markings. Lots of serial numbers. Documented, all the serial Heart numbers, numbers documented. Yeah. Get some photos. We've collected a lot of important clues with regard to our downed aircraft, and we can show them to our aviation expert. But now we got to hightail it out of here fast before the weather gets bad again. Watch out for the blue ice, guys. That's Glacier. It could take you right out of here. Now, we're going to meet with Rob and get his expert opinion as to what this downed aircraft might be. Guys, all right. Thank you, Thanks, Jack. Yeah, after you, sir. Hey, how you doing? Good, good. Long good time no see, see. Yeah. All right. We brought our friend with us. This okay. Our, this is Ken. Ken, this is Rob. Rob, hey. nice to meet you, man. Yeah, nice to meet you. Great hat. Oh, hey, you good too. to see you again. Back at you. Yeah. All right. So, what brings you guys here? So we were looking into those areas that you had pointed out in some of our research and stuff like that. And we were on our way back and just happened to visually see what it might, it might be our plane that we've been looking for. Oh, what have we got here? Well, we were hoping you could tell us. Hmm, interesting. All right. What else do you have to look at? Uh, there's one more. And then this one. We're hoping this might be our plane. Yeah, I think I can tell what that is. We're hoping this might be our plane. Yeah, I think I can tell what that is. I hate to tell you this, guys. It's not the right airplane. Oh. Well, that is really disappointing, guys. Extremely. It's a B-29 refueling version. There were actually two B-29s. The other one was coming back to uh, Anchorage, Elmendorf, and they, they ditched on a glacier. Rob has identified the craft as a known crash from the 50s, one of several during that decade, including the C-54. Well, this is really good news, because if there's multiple air crashes in this particular area, this could be the vortex we've been looking for. The fact that we've had so many downed military aircraft in one specific area, and it's the same area where we've had all these UFO sightings, it's very intriguing. I think we need to do more testing in this area, see what's going on out here. I agree, but let's get up there before sundown. Yeah. Rob, thanks for your time, man. All right. After landing, we picked a spot near where we found the plane crash. We think it has a high probability of success for our investigation. We're going to take EMF readings and scan for UFOs. We'll see if we can get any evidence to show proof of the vortex. You guys need to keep your eyes open. Bears can still be out. It's been a real mild winter out here. Keep your legs turning, guys. I know the air is getting thin, but one leg after another. Jax, Tommy, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Turn your lights off real quick. What do you got? Look on top of that peak right there. What is that? You see that, that I light? See, I see a glow. That's yeah, not a star, man. As we head up the mountain, I notice this really weird light hovering over one of the adjacent peaks. And as I watch it, this thing literally starts to move laterally from left to right. It looks like it's right on top of that mountain peak. I mean, that doesn't look like a star to me. No, it's not a star. It's glowing, though, whatever it is. I have no idea what I'm looking at. It just seems to be hovering and moving back and forth. I've never seen anything like this before. I think an airplane would be really faster than that. Oh, uh, definitely. I mean, come on, guys. It's definitely not a star. It's definitely not a satellite. It's unlike any phenomenon that I've ever observed. Hey, guys, I'm going to take this path up and see if we can get a better view of what we just saw. Jax is on a mission, bud. There's definitely something weird going on, and we can all sense it. 
We're moving up the mountain, and personally, I'm feeling pretty nervous. We don't know what we're gonna find. Did you guys just hear that? Thing, did you hear anything? Uh, I didn't hear anything! I'm coming down! Give me a sec. You all right? Yeah, I'm up there, and I can hear it going my direction to the right. It's somewhere in between us, the noise I heard. So I think we head up this path a little bit, see what we can see in between these two ridges before we make our way up this ridge. OK. Wait, let's get this out. How's the radiation, Tommy? 0.08 curies. That's normal. I'm going to do an EMF real quick. OK. Just... Oh, we're getting something. Look at that, man. It's crazy. We're definitely headed in the right direction. Eyes open, eyes open. Hey! What is that? Look! What is that? Hey, look at that. That looks like... Holy Dude, is, is that, that ours? It's ours, look! That's the friggin' box! This thing actually traveled from one area to another, and it's like it found us almost like someone was sending us a message. And honestly, it's kind of hard for me to wrap my mind around. We had that crazy weather, and all the instrumentation was going nuts when the drone disappeared, right? That was I mean, about it, two, and, two miles from here where we last saw it. I mean, it essentially vanished, guys. Let's be honest. Theoretically, it's been proven that something like a vortex could exist. And perhaps here in the Alaska Triangle, this so-called vortex could be the cause of many of the strange disappearances and airplane crashes. And perhaps it has a little bit of help. We'll never know for sure. With the fate of the military C-54 still unresolved, the team is left to ponder their evidence. They've learned that mining areas, rich in certain metals, can throw off a plane's instrumentation. They also know that jagged mountains and unpredictable weather are conventional reasons a plane might disappear. But could there be more? The team experienced areas of sudden unexplained magnetic fluctuations similar to readings in the Bermuda Triangle. Could this indicate a vortex, an interplanetary door? Is it just coincidence these places have UFO sightings in abundance? Well, this is one for the books. Yes, it is. Let's get out of here. The team will have to do more to find out why so many continue to go missing in Alaska.